بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, We are now starting our new series and this new series is about the Hayat of the Barzakh and of course this is a precursor to Qiyama and to uh, the knowledge of heaven and hell may Allah Azza wa grant us Jannah and protect us from Jahannam So we're working our way from the signs of Judgment Day until the actual Qiyamah and then what will happen after Qiyamah but there's going to be a few lectures that are in between and that in between is called the life of the Barzakh so in these series of lectures we will discuss what do we know about the life of the Barzakh and the term Barzakh is used in the Quran and it is an Arabic word that implies a barrier, a middle it implies something that is in between two things and Allah Azza wa Jal uses the barzakh in a physical and in a metaphysical sense. As for the physical, in Surah Ar-Rahman, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Maraj al-Bahrain yaltaqiyani bainahuma barzakh la yabghiyan." He has sent the two oceans or the two rivers flowing. Between these two rivers is what is a barzakh. Now, this barzakh is a physical barzakh. It's an actual barrier. So we get the word, what does barzakh mean? Barzakh means an actual middle, something that separates the two. And by the way, the majority of our ulama understood Maraj al Bahrain al Taqiyan as being the Red Sea and the Persian uh, Sea, or the, the Gulf, if you like. And the barzakh is the Arabian Peninsula. This is the majority interpretation of the scholars of the past. So it is as if Allah is saying, there's one ocean here, one ocean there. Between the two is the land of Hijaz, the land of Mecca and Medina. That is the barzakh that these two oceans can never intermingle in. So this explains to us what is the barzakh. The barzakh is something in the middle that allows two things to be distinct. Those two things will not interact with one another because of the buffer in the middle. That buffer is called the barzakh. With this physical barzakh, let us get to the metaphysical barzakh. What is the metaphysical barzakh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Surah Al-Mu'minun verse 100. This is the only ayah in the whole Quran that mentions barzakh in the metaphysical. The other barzakh is the physical. That's a physical barrier. Two oceans, there's a barzakh. The only ayah in the whole Quran that explicitly references Barzakh as a place between death and Qiyamah is Surah Al-Mu'minun verse 100. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that after death, وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ In front of them is going to be a Barzakh until the day they are resurrected. This is the only ayah in the whole Quran that uses the term barzakh the way that we're going to use it in this class, which is that interim, that buffer between this dunya and the next dunya. وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ In front of them, after their death, awaiting them, there shall be a barzakh until the day that they are resurrected. Now, there might only be one explicit reference of barzakh in the Quran, but there are many implied Quranic ayat about something after death and before resurrection. Okay? There are multiple ayat. How many? Scholars have differed because we're talking about indirect. Three, five, some have said uh, seven even verses. And these are all indirect. So we'll discuss maybe three of them right now. There are verses in the Quran that clearly affirm something will happen after death and before Qiyamah. And this must be the Barzakh. What are some of these verses? We'll mention a number of them. Of them is Surah Tawbah, verse 101. Surah Tawbah, verse 101. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, وَمِمَّنْ حَوْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مُنَافِقُونَ وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ Around you, there are the Bedouins and the hypocrites, even though some of them are in Medina, some of them are the Bedouins, they are hypocrites. Allah says, سَنُعَذِّبُهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَذَابٍ عَظِيمٍ سَنُعَذِّبُهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ We will punish them twice, and then we will send them to basically Jahannam. سَنُعَذِّبُهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ Qatada said, one time in this dunya, the second time in the Qabr, and then there will be Jahannam. Did you understand the indirect reference? 
سنعذبهم مرتين ثم يردون إلى عذاب عظيم. So we're going to punish them twice, then we will take them to Jahannam. What is the punishment twice? In this world, they will be humiliated. In this world, they will be discarded. In this world, they will go through the trials of this world. Then there's another punishment. When is this punishment that is before Jahannam? There must only be one time frame, and that is the Barzakh. So this is a reference indirectly. Indirectly because it's not explicit, but our scholars have derived the Barzakh from this. Also, another uh, indirect reference, Surat At-Tur, verse 47. Surat At-Tur, verse 47, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the fire of Jahannam. He mentions in the context of sending people to Jahannam. And then he says, Surah Tur, verse 47, But those who have committed dhulm, and dhulm here means shirk, those who have worshipped other than Allah, they shall also be punished. Remember the verse before is about Jahannam. Then Allah says, but that's not their only punishment. There shall be another punishment that is lesser than Jahannam. وَإِنَّ لِلَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا عَذَابًا دُونَ ذَلِكَ They will also have a punishment that is lesser than Jahannam. What is lesser than Jahannam? It is, Jahann- it is the Barzakh. And Ibn Abbas said, Ibn Abbas said that he explicitly quoted this verse and he said, this is عذاب القبر. They will have Adab duna thalik, duna thalik in Arabic, in Arabic means lesser than that. Ibn Abbas said duna thalik is a reference to adab al qabr. And so we have another indirect reference to something that will happen after death and before actual qiyamah. And perhaps the most explicit of the indirect references, because there's a direct reference, that's barzakh. The indirect references, there are many, but perhaps the most explicit is Surah Ghafir. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the father and son of the Fir'aun, right? All of you know that the Fir'aun that took care of Musa was not the same Fir'aun that then wanted to kill Musa. That was his son, right? As a father-son pair. So the, the Fir'aun that adopted Musa, then that Fir'aun dies. That Fir'aun's son comes to power and then Musa becomes a prophet and is sent to that Fir'aun. So we have the father-son Fir'aun, the pair Fir'aun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Ghafir, وَحَاقَ بِآلِ Fir'aun, سُوءَ Adab, The family of Fir'aun, meaning the father and son. They shall have a grave punishment. What is that punishment? Listen carefully. النَّارُ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا غُدُوًّا وَعَشِيَّةً وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَدْخِلُوا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ أَشَدَّ الْعَذَابِ The fire of hell will be shown to them, being close to them, drawn close to them, morning and evening. النَّارُ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا They will be roasted close by, but not directly. Arada means to show. Arada means to bring close to. So, يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا They will be brought close to Jahannam or Jahannam will be brought close to them morning and evening. Then, when Qiyamah occurs, it will be said, enter the fire of hell and be punished the worst punishment. Do you see how explicit this is? Then, when Qiyamah takes place, وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَدْخِلُوا آلَ فرعون. So what's happening before Qiyamah? They are not entering Jahannam. They're not inside Jahannam. What is happening? Jahannam is being shown to them. Jahannam is being brought close to them. النَّارُ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا غُدُوًّا وَعَشِيَّةً So Jahannam is being demonstrated to them morning and evening. Then, when Qiyamah takes place, Allah will say, cause them to enter Jahannam. So what was happening before Qiyamah? The Barzakh and Adab al Qabr. So we find here multiple evidences from the Quran that there's something after death and before Qiyamah, and this is the time frame known as the uh, Barzakh. And that's going to be our entire series, is basically however many times we, lessons we have, maybe three, maybe five. We don't have that much knowledge about the Barzakh. And all of our knowledge of the Barzakh, it is from the Ilm al Ghaib. Our minds have nothing to do with the barzakh. The barzakh is from the ilm al-ghayb. Whatever is in the Quran and Sunnah, we uh, take it. And the barzakh, when does it begin and when does it end? The barzakh begins from the moment the ruh permanently leaves the body. 
and it ends at the last trumpet to be blown. This is the barzakh. Okay? So the barzakh begins when the ruh leaves the body permanently. And the barzakh ends when the last trumpet is blown and all of the souls are resurrected. Now, the barzakh in this dunya, you might think that some people's barzakh is longer than others. But the barzakh is beyond our time and our space. So if somebody died 10,000 years ago, and somebody dies after 1,000, 2,000 years, how many years we have left, Allah knows, their barzakh is not necessarily different or more or longer. Because time in the barzakh is not the same as time in this dunya. So time for them is something completely different. And we will get to this point for the believer. The barzakh will be a place of quick ease. They will zoom through it, a place of peace. And for other than them, billah, the barzakh will seem to last an eternity. Even if maybe they were of the last generations, they will think they were in an eternity. So the time of the barzakh is irrelevant from our dunya. It is a separate time frame. It has nothing to do with us. So in order for us to then understand the concept of the barzakh, we need to begin very briefly. This isn't a detailed topic on this, but we have to begin today. At least half our lesson will be over the issue of the ruh and the body and the relationship between the ruh and the body because we're talking about when the ruh leaves the body, that is when barzakh begins. So we have to very briefly go into this issue of the ruh and the, uh, the jasad. And we know from the Quran and the Sunnah and the unanimous consensus of all of our scholars that there is something called a ruh inside of us, a spirit or a soul inside of us. And of course, Allah mentions this in many verses. They ask you, what is the human soul? What is the ruh? Tell them, respond to them. The ruh is from the matters of Allah, from the matters of your Lord, from the command or the knowledge of Allah. And you have not been given anything of knowledge except a very, very small amount. Now this ayah, which is Surah Isra, is very profound. We will begin our quick conversation on the ruh with it. We have very little knowledge about the ruh because Allah says so. The Bani Israel, the Yahud, they wanted to test the Prophet ﷺ. They asked him three questions. One of them, go ask the Prophet, they told the Quraysh, go ask him, what is the ruh? And they wanted to quiz him. Some ulama say that the quiz was, if he gave a lot of information, this would show that he is, a billah, a false prophet. Because no one has knowledge of the ruh. So this was the trap. He claims to be a prophet, ask him about the ruh. If he gave a detailed philosophical treatise about the ruh, the Yahud felt this is a fabrication, a fraud, because nobody can say anything about the ruh. So what was the response? They ask you about the ruh, tell them you have no knowledge of the ruh. So he passed the test. You understand? He passed the test because no one has knowledge about the ruh. So we have only a little bit of ilm about the ruh as the Prophet sallallahu was, or sorry, as the Quran tells us about this issue. And I find it very interesting, by the way, I find it very interesting that all civilizations in the globe and all the major faiths without exception they believed in the concept of the human soul. The ancient Chinese, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Christians, the Sikhs, the Muslims, the Abrahamic religions, and even the Greek philosophers, Plato and Socrates, and they're not even connected to a wahi. They have this concept of a ruh. The ruh is something that, pun intended, permeates through all of human civilization. All civilizations affirmed that the soul exists except for some modern pseudo-scientific people who deny everything they cannot understand. And so they say there's no such thing as the ruh because science cannot prove it. Forget them, everybody in human civilization believe there's something called a soul and there's something called a body. And we all understand from the Quran and Sunnah, and maybe one day, inshallah, we'll have a long lecture about this issue of Adam, the creation of Adam. But we all understand what made Adam, Adam was the ruh. Before that, Adam was teen, Adam was turab, Adam was clay. Before the ruh, Adam was fashioned clay. Allah says in the Quran, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُ لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ After I fashion him, then I blow my ruh into him. Then, 
prostrate down to him. And the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that when Allah fashioned Adam from clean, he left the body there. And Iblis came and began looking at this empty vessel. And he began knocking on the vessel. And that knocking, that is Salsal. Salsal ibn Hama ibn Masnoon. Salsal. Salsal is the pottery clay, potter's clay that has been put into the oven and taken out. And then when you hammer it, salsala, knock, knock. Like when we say in English, knock, knock. Salsala is the reverberation of the empty clay. This is what salsala. So Allah says, we created man from salsal. Salsal, when you knock on it, it will reverberate. There's going to be an echo. So Iblis is doing that to the body of Adam. Adam is not alive yet. Adam is just a jasad. Adam is a ruh. Sorry, Adam is a, a, a clay. Salsal. And Iblis, the Prophet said, Iblis entered and exited from this shell. Entered and exited. And he snorted and said, huh, anything that I can enter and exit from, I can control. Anything that I can come in and out of, I can control. And he felt he is better than Adam. Now, at this stage, Adam is not Adam. He's simply clay. When did Adam become Adam? The Prophet ﷺ tells us that when Allah blew the ruh into Adam, he blew from the top down. This we learn from the hadith, it's not in the Quran. He blew from the top down. And the ruh came from the head on downwards. And when it reached the nostrils of Adam, it tickled the nostrils. And what happens when something tickles the nostrils? Adam sneezed. And by that time, the ruh is reaching the mouth. He sneezes. And so even before the ruh is going to the body, Adam unconsciously, not unconsciously, sorry, subconsciously, without even having been taught anything explicitly, Adam says, Alhamdulillah. And this is a very profound reality that one day we will elaborate and deconstruct and talk more about the, the implications of this. Very profound. Without anyone saying anything to Adam, Adam says, Alhamdulillah. Where did he get it from? It comes from the fitra. So Adam says, Alhamdulillah. And Allah Azza wa Jal responds. How do you respond when somebody says, Alhamdulillah? Yarhamukallah. So the first phrase that our Lord said to the first man, and this is again very powerful. What was the first phrase that Allah said to the first man? Allah, ya Adam. And this is the default. The first thing that our Lord said to our father, even before the ruh entered the whole body, Allah, ya Adam. And the Prophet said, the ruh continued to go down until it reached the hands of Adam. Before it got to his foot, Adam tried to get up, but he couldn't. Because the ruh has not yet Reach down there. Adam's already trying to get up. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ How hasty is man. Just wait. How hasty is man. You have no patience. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ And this is a verse in the Quran, right? وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا And whatnot. So this is something there as well in the Quran. Now the point being that this concept of the, the ruh being blown into Adam, this is something that unfortunately some Innocent Muslims, inshallah, they're not sinister, though no scholar believes this, have misunderstood. And they believe, and this is a wrong belief, don't misunderstand me, this is a wrong belief that no scholar has ever said. They believe that this ruh that was blown into Adam is essentially a part of Allah or divine. When Allah says that He will blow His ruh into Adam, Allah is saying to the angels, when I blow my ruh into Adam, okay, some have misunderstood and they believe incorrectly that the ruh is a spark of divinity. The ruh is somehow divine. And that there is an element of divinity in all of us. And you hear this amongst the new age spiritualists. You hear this amongst people that 
they follow interpretations of religions other than mainstream Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And this goes back to an ancient religion called Gnosticism, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, Gnosticism. And the Gnostics, they were one of the earliest groups of, of uh, very ancient, like 4,000 years old, 3,000 years old. And they believed, literally, that their God, that's their version, disintegrated into a gazillion bits and each human being captured a little bit of the spark of the divinity. And you hear this phrase among some non-Muslim New Age spiritualists, oh, there's a spark of divine in all of us, right? You know, you've heard this phrase, right? There's an element of God in all of you. Where is this coming from? It's coming from Gnosticism. Right? And unfortunately, some Muslims, now they've heard it maybe from Gnostics or whatnot, they read the verse in the Quran, they don't understand, and they say, oh, so Allah is saying He blew His ruh into Adam. And they don't understand. Allah Azza wa Jal created a ruh, and that ruh was blown into Adam. The ruh is not Allah, a'udhu billah. Adam does not have, a'udhu billah, divinity. Adam is makhluq. The ruh is makhluq. The ruh is not khaliq. The ruh is not the created entity, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal ascribes things to himself as a matter of honor. When Allah says, his house, the house is created, the Kaaba. When Allah says, his messenger, the messenger is created, not, not the creator. When Allah says, uh, wa suqiyaha, the camel of Allah, because the camel of, of, of Salih, right? Naqatullah, the camel of Allah. Allah calls the naqa his naqa. Obviously, the naqa is, is it created or creator? What is the naqa? It is created, right? Of course it is created. Anytime Allah ascribes something to himself and it is a physical object, realize this is an ascription of honor. Allah wants to honor this object by saying, this is mine, my abd, wa maqama abdullah, my rasul, rasulullah, my house, my camel, my ruh. It doesn't mean, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, that a bit of Allah entered Adam. A'udhu billah. No Muslim scholar says this. It's just a misunderstanding that some Muslims, they have taken from Gnostics and they believe. Understand when Allah says, I blew my ruh into Adam, he is saying he created something very amazing. And it's so amazing, Allah says, this is mine, my ruh. You understand, right? The ruh is created. It is not a part of Allah. And it is an amazing creation. It is a blessed creation. It is a creation we will never understand. So Allah says, this is my creation. This is my ruh. So then Allah says, when, he blew my, when, when I blow my ruh into Adam. So Adam's ruh was created directly by Allah. And that's why Allah says in the Quran that قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي Adam's ruh, Allah created it. And as an honor to Adam, Allah Azza wa Jal, in a way we will never understand, we don't think about these things, He blew the ruh directly into Adam. The ruh is created. The body is created. Adam is created. Understand this, right? Allah, in a way we will never understand, nafakha. Allah blew the ruh into Adam. And Adam becomes the human being. Jayyid. Now, how about the uh, children of Adam and their ruh? Where does our ruh come from? From this, we learn where does this ruh come from? We learn this from the Quran and from the Sunnah. There's only one reference indirectly in the Quran, and the Sunnah has a lot of references. As for the Quran, Surah Al A'raf, verse 172, is the only detail that we have on this issue of where we were created, our ruh was created, and the hadith mentions, there's three or four hadith that mention this narrative. What is Surah Al A'raf, verse 172? Allah says in the Quran, bani Adama, min zuhurihim dhurriyatahum. Remember, Remember, whenever Allah says وَإِذْ, it means remember, recall, recall. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ Remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from the children of Adam, from their backs, that He took their progeny. And وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ He caused them to be witnesses against themselves. They took the dock, the witness sand, and they witnessed, they testified against themselves. Now the verse needs to be understood in light of hadith. The hadith gives us the fuller picture. What happens? The hadith tells us, and I'm going to summarize three or four hadith. There's these hadith are in Sahih Muslim, in Musadraq of Al-Hakim, and in uh, Abu Dawud, there's a reference as well. You put all of these hadith together, what I'm saying is the conglomeration of a number of hadith. We learn from the hadith as follows, that when Adam came down to this earth, 
and Allah Azza wa Jal accepted his repentance, we learn from our tafsir literature that this acceptance took place in Arafat. This is not a hadith, it's tafsir literature. And this makes sense because Arafat is where tawbah is accepted from the hujjaj. So Allah accepted the tawbah of Adam at Arafat. This is, remember, it's not hadith. So when I'm very, uh, you will learn this about me. I'm very, ac- I try to be accurate. I don't just mention things like this. Whenever I say something, I always try to back, where did I get this from? And if I never, if I don't say this, always ask me, where did you get it from? We have to be very clear here. Our religion is based on the evidences and the sources. We don't just, we don't just, spout things out and we differentiate between the Quran and between hadith and between statements of the Sahaba and between statements of earlier scholars we differentiate between them not all are on the same level where do we get this idea that Adam's tawbah was accepted at Arafat we find it in early tafsir literature some of the tabi'un said this it is not in the Quran it is not in the sunnah so we can narrate it but it's not something that is yaqeen early scholars of the second generation they held this view that Adam's tawbah was accepted in Arafat and we say it makes sense now one thing we know for sure from the hadith and now we come to the hadith once Adam's tawbah is accepted the hadith says this is from the hadith this is from the Prophet and this hadith is in Mustadrak al-Hakim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rubbed the backbone of Adam and from the backbone of Adam He extracted every single soul that would be in existence until Qiyamah. Now this is very important now. Because this is our origin and birth. This is where we come into existence as our souls. Where was Adam's soul created? Up there. Who created it? Allah directly created it from there. From what? We have no idea. No idea. It is something beyond. Where was our soul created? In this earth it was created. From what? From the backbone, and we can say from the soul of Adam. Okay? And this is what the Quran is mentioning. From the Zuhur, from the backbone, from the sulb. In the, the hadith uses the word min aslabihim, right? The sulb. And uh, 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 what is sulb? Sulb is the backbone. So the hadith mentions Allah extracted from the backbone and from the soul, whatever you want to call that, every single soul that would ever be born until Qiyamah. And this happened at Arafat. So when I'm at Arafat and I'm doing Hajj with my group, I always say, We were born in Arafat. And there's truth to this statement. We were born in Arafat. Our spiritual birth, our physical birth, where our mothers gave birth to us. But our ruh was born in Arafat. This is in the hadith. Okay? So, Allah Azza wa Jal created our ruh from Adam directly. And this ruh, it existed without a body. There is no body, obviously. This is the beginning of our ruh. And the ruh then, the Quran tells us, that أَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ He caused these arwah to witness against themselves. You see, in our constitution, we have something called the fifth. What is the fifth? Hmm? You, you have the right to not testify against you. You have the right to be quiet. But on Judgment Day, and right now, there is no fifth. On Judgment Day, Allah will نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ There is no fifth. Your body will testify. The good and the bad. We ask Allah's afia. And when we were created, there is no fifth. And Allah speaks directly to the souls. And what was the question? It is in the, in the Quran. Alastu bi rabbikum. And this is called Yawmi Alast. The day of am I not? Yawmi Alast. It is also called the day of the Mithaq. Because Wait Akhad Rabbuka min bani Adam Idurim Duriyatum. This is the Mithaq. And the Prophet said, Akhad Allahu Azza wa Jal al Mithaq. Min uh Bani Adam uh, the Prophet took the Mithaq from the children of Adam at Arafat. So the word Mithaq is used. What is Mithaq? 
Mithaq is a covenant, a treaty. So what was the treaty? What was the covenant? What was the conditions of the treaty? Very simple. Don't you know I am your Rabb? Don't you know I am your Rabb? And again, this is so powerful because Allah didn't say, I am your Rabb. He said, don't you know I am your Rabb? Am I not your Rabb? What is the difference between saying, I am your Rabb versus saying, am I not your Rabb? The first is a teaching mechanism. The first you say to somebody who doesn't know anything. The first you say to somebody on a blank slate, you tell him, this is your God, this is your prophet, this is your Quran. You are teaching. The second is a rhetorical question, which you do not say to teach. You say to confirm something that is already known. Right? To confirm a rhetorical question is not used to teach. A rhetorical question is used to confirm something already known. Allah did not need to teach us that He is our Lord. Do you understand this? A very deep point. Allah did not need to teach us who created you, who is your Lord. Allah didn't need to do that. Allah is simply affirming, Am I not your Lord? And what did we all respond? The Quran says, Bala. Yes, O oh Allah, you are our Lord. Yes, we affirm you are our Lord. Now, how did we know Allah? Is, now, at this point in time, at this point in time, we are souls. Question Have these souls been sent a prophet? Yes or no? No. Have these souls been sent Wahi, Quran, Torah, Zabur? No. Have these souls had a chance to even you have an aql and wander in this earth and look at the ayat of Allah? No. So how are the souls expected to know when there is no wahi, there is no revelation, there is no prophet, there is no ayat at tadabbur? How are they expected to know? Response, the fitrah that Allah created the soul with. The fitrah is something that is ingrained in us. Fitrat Allahi lati fatara nasa alayha. So the souls were scattered in front of Allah. How do we know this? The hadith. Fanatharahum bayna yaday. The Prophet said, He scattered all of these souls in front of him. Allah scattered all of these souls. Adam is there, all of us are behind Adam. This is happening in Arafat. How many souls? Every single one. We were there. Our forefathers were there. Our children were there. Everyone that will ever live and breathe, even one breath, was there. All of us were there. And he then took the covenant. This is the mithaq. Okay. This is the creation of our soul. This soul, it remains in a state that we don't have any idea about. We have no idea where it is. Nothing is mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah until the next reference. And that next reference, Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the Hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, basically he uh, coagulates the creation uh, of the fetus inside of the womb of the mother until finally uh, a certain number of days pass. Then the angel comes with the ruh. And the angel blows the ruh into the fetus. Who blew the ruh into Adam? Allah Azza wa Jal. Who will blow the ruh into us? Me and you and our children and our forefathers? The angel. Big difference. Allah gave Adam. Allah gave, يعني, honored Adam in some ways. And the angel comes. The angel blows the ruh into the fetus. And that is when the fetus takes on a living status. Now, our scholars of fiqh, our scholars of fiqh uh, go into a lot of detail when this occurs because there are repercussions that have to do with when and under what circumstances is uh, the Islamic verdict of abortion, which is much more complicated than, uh, than right now. That's a fiqhi discussion. But it all centers over when the ruh is blown in because that's when this entity becomes a living human being. And when that happens then to take that life is murder. And before that happens, there's controversy. So I'm not going down there. Maybe one day we'll have a Q&A about that's a separate issue altogether. But the point being that this is the uh, second stage. So there are five stages, by the way, of the ruh. Very quickly, we'll go over them. Number one, the first stage, from the creation until before the fetus. 
We have no information about nothing from the Quran and Sunnah. Where is it? Who is protecting it? How is it living? Zero information. Nothing. The second stage, when the ruh is blown into the fetus. And it remains in the body. And this is essentially what we are right now. And we can call this the wakeful state. The state of the child or the young man or the old man when they are awake. And this is the body and the soul are together and combined in one and the both of them are conscious this is the wakeful state and this is what i hope all of us are in right now inshallah i hope none of us are in the third which is the sleeping state right anybody in the sleeping state you can raise their hand and that's a problem this the third is the sleeping state and the sleeping state the ruh leaves the body but not permanently the ruh leaves the body, but not permanently. And there is some connection that the ruh has with the body. What that connection is, we really don't know. But there is some connection. Ibn al-Qayyim mentions in his kitab al-Ruh, and others mention this as well, that there seems to be some type of thread connection, like a minuscule, invisible thread between the body and the ruh. That the ruh and the body are still somehow... Now, this isn't an actual thread. You cannot cut it with... It's a metaphysical thread. It's a thread that is from the ruh world, not from the body world. And the ruh and the body are connected. And that's why when something happens to the body, the ruh rushes back and you just wake up. Whoa, what happened? Like it comes back immediately. You wake up with the jolt, right? So the ruh is coming back immediately. So the issue of the ruh separating from the body during sleep is something that is explicit in the Quran and in the Sunnah. This is something very clear and it is a part of our theology to believe. What is sleep? Sleep is the temporary separation of the ruh from the body. And of course, there is the famous verse in the Quran that mentions this. Which verse is this? O oh, Hufad, Ya Hafadah, where are the, which verse am I talking about? Which one? Where is it? Yes, very good. Surah Al-Zumar, very good. Allah says in the Quran, Allahu yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha wallati lam tamut fi manamiha Allah takes two souls Allah takes two souls two categories number 1 when the souls die Allahu yatawaffa al-anfus right when they die number 2 wallati lam tamut fi manamiha and those that are not dead but they're asleep so Allah is explicitly saying I take the souls of those who are sleeping. So sleeping, Allah takes the soul away. But it is a temporary taking away. The barzakh doesn't begin there. The barzakh begins when the connection breaks between the body and the uh, soul. And that's why our Prophet also said, for example, he said, Annawmu akhu al maut. It's an authentic hadith. Three words. Annawmu akhu al maut. Sleeping is the brother of death. Sleeping and death are twins. Sleeping and death are very similar. And that is why it's very common for people to pass away in sleep because Allah says those whom Allah has decreed will die in their sleep Allah says he keeps the soul and the others he sends them back until their time will come this is all in the Quran and that's why it's very common one of the most common ways of dying is a peaceful death when you go to sleep and you just pass away you don't wake up this is mentioned in the quran so this person his soul went to sleep then the soul is taken away and then death occurs so this is the third state right so memorize this this is something that we should all know number one pre-birth number two and this begins in the wombs of our mother and that is the relationship we have right now because by the way modern science has shown even the fetus is awake and asleep even in the womb of your mother, there are states when you're awake and there are states when you're asleep. Subhanallah, this is hadha khalqullah. That even that pre-born child, right? The child inside the womb of the mother is already awake and asleep. And then when the child comes out and we are now that stage, it's the same in terms of the relationship between the body and the soul. So the, the, the second we said is the wakeful state. The third is the sleep state. And because sleeping is the brother of death, there shall be no sleep in Jannah or in Jahannam. There is no need to sleep because there is no death. You will perpetually be awake without caffeine. Can you believe? <laughs> Although you can drink caffeine if you want, inshaAllah ta'ala, because some of us, whatever you want in Jannah, you will get. And anything halal and caffeine is halal. So uh, 
where am I going, subhanAllah? <laughs> How did that tangent come along? Uh, what was I saying? My mind is completely blank. The, yeah, so there is no sleep in Jannah. Why is there no sleep in Jannah? Because sleep is what? The taking of the body out of the soul, and that's not going to happen in Jannah. So there is no sleep in Jannah. You're never going to get tired in Jannah. That's the third state. The fourth state is what we're going to talk about in our series, and that is the barzakh. And the barzakh is this time frame when the ruh and the jasad break the connection, when the ruh and the jasad break the connection, and that ruh then goes into this zone called the barzakh, and then the fifth state comes, and the fifth state is when the final trumpet is blown. Not the first trumpet, the final one. Some ulama say three trumpets, some ulama say four trumpets, some ulama say two trumpets. We'll talk about the issue of trumpets when we get there after the barzakh. The very first lesson after the barzakh will be talking about the number of trumpets and the scholars' difference of opinion over that. But the point is, the barzakh lasts until the last trumpet, not until the first trumpet. When the first trumpet is blown, the first trumpet is for this dunya, not for the people of the barzakh. The people of the barzakh have nothing to do with that first trumpet. The second or the third or the fourth, depending on how many trumpets you affirm. Inshallah, we're going to jump the gun here. I will say the correct opinion, inshallah, from the Quran Sunnah seems to be two trumpets. Many ulama said three, many ulama even, some ulama even said four. But to the position I will advocate, and Allah knows best, will be two trumpets. And... The barzakh lasts until the second of the two trumpets. Then the fifth stage begins, and that is the final stage. And what stage is that? The permanent reuniting of the ruh with the jasad in the next world. So the jasad is not the jasad of this dunya, flesh and bones. It's a different type of jasad. It's a different creation of Allah, not this creation, not this world that we live in. It is a different world. And when that reuniting occurs, that is going to be the permanent reuniting and the most perfect reuniting that overshadows all previous four stages. And that is why there is no moat, there is no sleeping, there is no tiredness, there is no negative issues once that happens and the ruh and the jasad are fully reconnected. Our series of lectures will deal with category number four, and that is <coughs> the issue of the barzah. One final hadith, inshallah, <coughs> and then we'll open the floor for questions. And that is, there is one hadith that some scholars have interpreted to mean the pre-Barzakh uh, era. <coughs> and that is the hadith in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-arwahu junudun mujannada. Al-arwahu junudun mujannada. The souls are like groups of armies or battalions of armies lined up. فَمَا تَعَارَفَ مِنْهَا اَتَلَفْ وَمَا تَنَاكَرَ مِنْهَا اَخْتَلَفْ رَاهُ الْبُخَارِي So the souls that know one another, تَعَارُفْ even in Urdu تَعَارُفْ مَا تَعَارَفَ مِنْهَا The souls that know one another, the souls that have ma'rifa with one another, اَتَلَفْ They become friends. وَمَا and the souls that there's nakara, there's not getting along, there's something that ikhtalaf, they have ikhtilaf. This is one of those hadith that we'll have to try to understand the best we can because it's a very deep hadith and scholars have interpreted in different ways. Some of them have said that let's just understand this hadith as being from this dunya, not pre dunya, this dunya. And that some souls get along with other souls and when the soul gets along with the other soul the two bodies get along and they become friends and life is good and some souls don't get along with other souls and when that happens they're not friends they're enemies and that's a valid interpretation okay however a number of ulama ibn hazm amongst them and before al khattabi might have mentioned this ibn hajj mentioned some discussion about this as well they go even deeper than this and this is very profound and allah knows best and they say, perhaps in this world, before this world, when the souls were all together, some souls became friendly with one another. And when they find themselves in this dunya, automatically they become friendly in this dunya as well, because they were friendly in there as well. And some souls didn't get along over there. And so 
in this dunya as well, when they discover one another, they don't get along. Okay? Allahu A'lam. It's Ibn Hazm's interpretation. And it's the, 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 the wording allows for this interpretation. That al arwahu junudun mujannada. Fama ta'arafa minha talaf, wama tanakara minha talaf, reported by Bukhari. And Allah knows best this seems to be the understanding of some of the Sahaba because there is a version of this hadith in Muslim Abu Ya'la that Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, it was reported in her time from after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that there was uh, a lady from Mecca who was known to be like, we would call her like a, uh, a joker. You know, always cracking jokes, a practical prankster, something like this, right? She was known for this, always cracking jokes and being, you know, that type of person. When she came to Medina, the lady that she became best friends with happened to be the one who did the same in Medina. Okay, the, that her, that she had the reputation of always cracking jokes and being the prankster and whatnot. So, when this news reached Aisha, she said, my beloved has spoken the truth. Sadaqa hibbi. My beloved, meaning the Prophet has spoken the truth. Then she narrated this hadith. So the context was what? These two people did not know one another. But as soon as they met, they became best of friends. How did this happen? Their souls had a connection before their bodies met. And... Therefore, when they met for the first time, they became close friends. And subhanAllah, I have to say, wallahi, it's so amazing that sometimes you meet a person for the first time and within a 10, 15, 20 minute conversation, you know, oh, this person I will get along with very well. He's going to be good brother. Or sister meets sister. Oh, this is a sister. I can be her confidant. I can be a good friend to her. And sometimes you'll meet somebody for 10, 20 times. And yeah, it's okay. Salaamu alaykum as salam good enough. How? How do you know instantaneously? This hadith tells us there's something that is beyond and that is something that the souls go back to. So to conclude today's lesson, inshallah, so I'm going to try to finish off every day around 9.30 and then open the floor, open the floor for Q&A, inshallah. I don't, want, I don't want to go too long because I know it's a work day. So to conclude, we began today talking about the barzakh and when it begins and in order to understand that we needed to talk about the five categories of the relationship between the body and the soul and this is something that all of us should know and so we're into a little bit of detail about these five categories and the barzakh is the fourth of these five categories and that's what we will be discussing from next Wednesday inshallah we will begin our discussion of exactly when the body leaves the soul which is called death we'll talk a little bit about what we know about the reality of death and then move on to what is going to happen after death and with that inshallah if there are any questions 10 minutes of q a inshallah bismillah is good bismillah is good our brother says what is the nafs because allah mentions the nafs and the ruh and the jasad and the relationship between the nafs and the ruh. You know what? I will discuss it next week, even though I want it to khalas. I will add it for you. Just because you asked it, I will inshallah begin a little bit about that. No problem, inshallah. You had a question, go ahead, brother. Uh, in the, in the day of judgment, there is a judgment as well. So our brother says that in judgment day, there will be heaven and hell, there will be hisab. What is the purpose of the when the qiyamah will take place and heaven and why the punishment is in barzakh uh, we'll discuss this in detail in two weeks but now I will just say the Prophet ﷺ said that the qabr is the first station of the many stations of the akhirah and if the beginning station is good the rest will be good and if the beginning station is not good, the rest will not be good. So the qabr is the precursor to what's going to happen afterwards. And the one who has a good experience in the qabr, may Allah make us amongst them. We want our qabrs to be vast. We want our qabrs to be enlightened. We want our qabrs to show us our place in Jannah. And we want to be wanting to go to Jannah. Whoever gets that, inshallah, the rest will be easy. The opposite can be one of two categories. Either a person like the family of Fir'aun that 
that barzakh is the first punishment to torture them even more in Jahannam. So that is the torture, that is the pre-torture of the real torture. And that too is torture and they deserve it. Or it is a third category. Meaning the first is the people of Jannah. The second is the evil people of Jahannam. The third is a category. They potentially deserve Jahannam. But Allah will end up forgiving them because of some good deeds they have done. And that forgiveness will come with some torture that is not as bad as the torture of Jahannam. And therefore there will be Muslims, believers in Allah, who fell short of the wajibat. And they might be punished in the qabr. And they think they're going to be punished in Jahannam because they deserve that punishment. But because of good deeds they have done, Allah will forgive them on the hisab. But they needed to go through the punishment of the qabr to get there. And we'll discuss this more in detail, inshallah. Sisters, yes, go ahead, sisters. What one sister first? Go ahead. So our sister asks that do we as Muslims have any belief about what is called near death experiences? And the response is to the best of my knowledge, there is nothing explicit in the Quran and Sunnah that would affirm this. On the contrary, on the contrary. This would go against the notion of the Malakul Maut being sent by Allah when the time comes. What we believe, angels don't make mistakes. What we believe, that nobody is going to see the angel of death other than the prophets. The prophets are the only ones that get the choice. We know this from the hadith. The angel of death asks permission. May I take your soul? Out of, out of adab. And every prophet says yes, except for Musa, the story will come to inshallah, that he didn't recognize the malakul maut. Uh, but the only one who gets asked is the prophets. As for the rest of mankind, if you read this genre, this genre is about people who say, oh, I saw a white light. I saw a peaceful entity. And then I woke up. And the interpretation they have they saw God, or they saw the angel, or they saw the angel of death, and then the angel changed his mind, or God said, oh, not yet, you have time, you have left, go back. It's as if the angel changed his mind, or Allah made a mistake. We don't believe this. So, while I cannot categorically state anything 100%, because it's not in the Quran and Sunnah, I would say, and Allah knows best, that it doesn't appear to be a valid category that a person sees the akhirah and then is brought back to this dunya because that's a type of death that is not death and that is seeing the angel of death before death and we don't believe this it doesn't make sense so the only other interpretation is that this is the imagination of the one who is seeing it we're not doubting their sincerity this is the imagination of that person and that's something that is totally valid the person can imagine building himself up to the state Allah knows best okay other questions yes go to the back brother go ahead how do we explain dreams uh, so dreams are of three categories dreams are of three categories and all three of them are somehow related to the soul. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim and others, they affirm this. One category is the soul's itself's interactions and play things that it does. So the soul might meet somebody and that might be a deceased person or might be somebody else and you dream about that. And you have actually met that person in the soul world, right? You have actually met and you dream about it. So the soul is interacting and you are having a dream about the interaction of the soul. This is one category. Another category is the evil shayateen interacting with your soul. And the evil shayateen interacting with your soul is a type of nightmare. And so any nightmare that we have or anything of a fahisha or lewd nature that we see, two categories of interactions. Whenever an evil entity interacts, 
either it is something to terrify you or it is something of a fahisha nature and a person is not sinful for what they see in the dream but it is shaitan teasing you it is shaitan trying to incite you and whatever it incites in the dream we are forgiven and whatever happens and if we wake up we have to take ghusl we are forgiven there's no sin in that but it is something the shaitan does this is the second category uh, one can say there is the third category which is a type of ilham from Allah which is a dream from Allah so Allah Azza wa Jal inspires the soul not an inspiration of the prophets because there's categories of inspiration and the lowest category is ilham and ilham is something that Allah gives to even the animals وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ the the nahl um the nahl so there is a wahi that even the angels have sorry not the angels even the animals have and the mother of musa had it and all of us might have it it is called ilham that is a dream from allah then you have the fourth category and that is hadith nafs and hadith nafs is the soul we call it daydreaming but it is not daydreaming it is night dreaming when you daydream, you are awake and you daydream. When your soul daydreams, that is most of your average dreams that you have. So you want a fancy car. You're wanting the car for many, many weeks or months, right? What was the car you wanted again? The Maybach, right? So he wants the Maybach. 1.3 million, how much is it? So he's already wanting it. Have you have your first job yet or not? So still, $10 an hour, you'll get it soon, inshallah. Don't worry, keep on saving. Uh, and it's good. You started at 10, I started at $4 an hour. SubhanAllah. Thank Allah. The minimum wage has been raised. Still, you want the Maybach. You want the Maybach. You make dua for the Maybach. You go to sleep. You dream of the Maybach. Sorry to break your bubble. This is not from Allah Azza wa Jal, most likely. This is from you. How do you know it is from you? Generally speaking, when you dream about what you are always thinking about, this is from you. Okay? How do you know it's from Shaitan? Either something that terrifies you or something of a fahisha nature. How do you know it is from Allah? It is something that is vivid and clear and comes out of the blue. You don't understand. It's usually symbolic. Like what was that dream about? Or it could be a positive dream. You, grew, you wake up happy if you met a relative, deceased relative. Generally, that's Allah gifted it to you. You go and meet somebody and you remember that dream. So these are the different dreams that we have. All of this goes back to the ruh, inshallah ta'ala. Back to the sisters. Yes, in the back, sister. In the chair, go ahead. Yes. I cannot hear you at all. You have to speak louder. We will talk about where the soul is after that. That's the whole series of lectures, inshallah. You're in the right lecture series, inshallah. Sister, go ahead, yes. Are there any du'as to make for the soul itself? Wallahi, that's a question that I'll have to think about. Nothing comes to my mind immediately because when you make du'a, you make du'a for the body and soul together. Right? Oh Allah, guide me. Who is me? It is your soul and your body together. And you make dua for your qabr to be a good place. And that is an indirect dua for the soul. But specifically to mention the word soul in the dua, I'll have to think. That's a question I've never been asked. Let me think about this, inshallah. Final question before we break for today. Bismillah, go ahead. I didn't say this. Allah says, when you go to sleep, your soul is taken away. This is in the Quran. This is a very good question. Do those who die in their sleep go through sakaratul maut? The response to this, inshallah, we will discuss. But in a nutshell, uh, sakaratul maut sometimes occurs in a state that the people around cannot detect. Going through sakarat doesn't mean that the person next to you knows that you're going through sakarat. There could be sakarat that the ruh is undergoing and the body does not know about it. And as well, sometimes Allah blesses some people to pass away without sakarat. And that's something that not every single soul goes through. There's some exceptions that take place. For example, for the shaheed, there is no sakarat for the shaheed. But generally speaking, the default is the average person that passes away, there are sakarat. What do we say to the one who passes away in his sleep? The response, we're going to come to in more detail later, but their sakarat will be in a way that we cannot detect, we cannot know. But still, 
the cutting of that line and the final stages these are sakarat and sometimes it occurs and the body is still breathing and awake and sometimes it occurs and the body is unconscious or asleep that doesn't mean the sakarat isn't occurring it means you cannot detect it and there's a difference between the two inshallah with this we will conclude and resume next Wednesday jazakumullah khair assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh